This is Lessons in Leadership. I'm Steve Adubato. If you're catching us for the first time on radio on AM 970 or a podcast or on the video side, this is a show all about leadership, everything you wanted or needed to know about leadership. That's what we do. Together with my colleague and co-host, Mary Gamba. How are we doing, Mary? We're doing great. Doing great. We're telling folks, uh, where are we telling folks we're coming from? We are coming from beautiful East Main Media Studios. In and beautiful where? Little Falls, New Jersey. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Great studio, great operation. Thank you yeah. to Brian Brodeur and his team. And uh, Mary, before we go to our colleague and friend, Greg Lalavi, let folks know where they can find us other than listening to us right now. Absolutely. So for those listening on radio, uh, definitely uh, when you're in a safe place, if you're driving, you can look us up on Facebook at Steve Adubato, PhD, that's A-D-U-B-A-T-O, as well as on Twitter at Steve Adubato. You can subscribe to the podcast to hear our previous episodes, and you can do that on Apple Podcasts as well as on Google Play. And as always, we have a ton of great resources on our website, which is stand-deliver.com. Also, by the way, you can go on the AM970 app and find us there as well. Um, And again, the reason we're on video is because we're looking forward to having folks see what we do as well as hear it. Let's introduce our good friend, Greg Lalavi, who is in fact the uh, business manager, the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825. Good to see you, Greg. Good to see you. Thanks for having me. Uh, We talk about leadership all the time. We'll get into a lot of the details about your view and your philosophy of leadership and also how you've evolved as a leader. But real quick, tell folks what the organization is. Uh, We are 7,400 men and women. Uh, We primarily operate heavy equipment on construction sites. So we'll build your roads, your bridges, your buildings. Uh, We also work in mines around the state. We also work for companies that are dealers of equipment, and we do the product support and the repair of the equipment. You grew up in this union. I did. Followed Followed my father into it. Wow. So we've watched it evolve over time. And your brother's in it. Uh, Both my brothers are in it, and I have a cousin who's in it. It's in your blood. Yes. For a long time, I've been doing leadership um, coaching, if you will. We have a leadership academy at Local 825 that we've been doing that Greg is actively involved in. Our company provides that uh, work for them, and they're also one of our big supporters on public broadcasting of our work. But Greg, you introduced this book to me. I thought, you you look around here, you see these leadership books, and they're not props. They're props, but they're books that we've read, not all of it, but We've read a lot of it, and they've influenced us, and that's why we incorporate them into a conversation, our conversation. But Greg talked to me about this book about, I don't know, four months ago, Extreme Ownership. He'll set it up for us. We've now stolen it, and we're forcing everybody else to read Mm -hmm. it. Great book. Extreme Ownership, How U.S. Navy SEALs Lead and Win. Set it up for us. So, So this book is written by a couple of Navy SEALs, and they just talk about what their leadership philosophy is and how they ran Uh, their unit uh, when they were in Iraq. And when they talk about extreme ownership, they start right out at the beginning and talk about there being no excuses or not pointing any fingers. And no matter what the situation is or whatever may have gone wrong, if something went wrong, that each of us has a responsibility to look inside and figure out what they may have done uh, differently. So for instance, I just did something with my staff at work and I wasn't getting back uh, what I thought I expected from them all, and I realized that I communicated poorly in what it is I wanted as a finished product. So I own that piece of it. How'd you own it? I I just uh, told the guys when they asked me, is this what you wanted? When I said, no, but that's not on you, that's on me. I communicated what I wanted poorly. That's hard to say, though. I'm impressed. I mean, that's a really hard leadership quality to be able to say and admit that it was not you, it's me. And I'll complicate it even more. Some of your folks have told me that that is somewhat different in you. What they mean is they've seen you evolve as a leader and your ability to own it and say, yeah, my bad, really quick, no excuses, that that's not totally brand new, but you've evolved into that. Is that fair? It's very fair. Uh, But but to take it from the book, one, one of the authors speaks about an operation that went completely wrong. In Iraq? Yes. And so his senior leaders came and he had to take a look at what went wrong, break it down. And he could have laid it on about four different people. But when the moment came, he accepted it himself. And what was uh, very uh, moving to me in that moment was he brought it out to where that earned him the trust and credibility of so many others around him because he was willing to accept his responsibility for what went wrong and to own it and to change it. So think about this. How often do we see presidents and governors and all kinds of people, including new heads of organizations, 
blame, talk about the opposite, the antithesis of everything you just described, the opposite of extreme ownership. How often do you hear people say, it was the other, it was the previous president, it was the previous governor, it was the CEO before me, it was the person who headed up this department before me. Don't put it on me, look at what's been put in my lap. And then four years later, they're still talking about the other person. Is that the opposite of everything you just said? I believe it is. And, and actually what I was able to do is the lesson that came uh, in this book about taking ownership brought me back to the day I graduated high school. Um, Tell folks where you went, because we talk about the influence that certain kinds of schools have had on us. Go I, ahead. I went to Del Barton School in Morristown. As uh, is Catholic in Newark, doesn't exist anymore. Go ahead. Uh, but the uh, priest, Father Giles Hayes, uh, who's unfortunately passed recently, uh, was the headmaster at the time. And in his graduation remarks, uh, he spoke about pointing the finger at other people. And so he made the gesture where he pointed and he said, when you do that, if you flip your hand over, you have three pointing back at yourself. And as I've gone through life, anytime I've gotten into, we've all gotten into the heated moment where somebody will go, the you, the minute that Look happens. Look at that finger coming out. Yeah, the you. minute that happens, I realize they're telling me about themselves. Almost each and every time they're telling me what their orientation is, what their disposition is, what point of view they may be coming from. They're trying to lay it off on somebody else. But it's really about them. Yes. Mary, jump in. I, mm -hmm. I, I see you fascinated. Well, right no, now. I'm laughing because one thing that Steve often does is instead of point, he often does this. So he makes sure to point all the time. <laughs> 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 and, and maybe Hold subconsciously on. something was straight. happening. But Mary, right, Brian, listen you to see Greg Lalavie give this incredibly powerful, profound it, analysis it of point. Mm -hmm. And Mary says, Steve doesn't point. He goes like this. So what are you trying to say? <laughs> it deflects all. <laughs> I'm just joking. Um, but you do. Please I, and I noticed all that. of that out. Okay. I'm sure you do that because of rudeness. You don't want to be pointing at someone, but it's, yeah, it's But if so I'm trying to have somebody in a seminar, I'll open my hand. Mm -hmm. But you listen to Greg talk about evolving in that way. Mm -hmm. You and I talked about this a lot. If leaders don't constantly learn and evolve, mm -hmm. they don't they just die. stay the way mm -hmm. they are. They go backwards and they die. Go ahead. Yeah, they go backward. They die, not in the literal sense, but they do. All of their, we always, we always talk about innovation and we talk about ways to renew and find new ways of doing things. And if you are too busy finger pointing, assigning blame, as Steve and I always talk, and it took us a long time to get here, we always talk about it's a lot easier to admit where you made a mistake, own it and then literally go right into the next step of, all right, what are we gonna do about it so it doesn't happen again? But that's really hard to do in leadership. And to that point, Greg, your men, your people, they see you doing it. I'm convinced that because I've gotten better, at least in my mind, um, about blaming, because I was always quick to blame, very quick to blame. My problem is I, I think that because I'm owning it, then you better own it. And I get, I get frustrated when some team members and others don't own it. You? In this project that I just alluded to a minute ago, a few of the staff were behind the deadline in getting it to me. And each of them picked up their phone and called me and apologized and accepted it, which just makes me believe in this topic of extreme ownership even more and that the leader can lead people into this. How about no excuses? How about the no excuses concept? Someone might say, yeah, uh, I, and it went wrong. I'll take that part of it. But what you don't understand is, and then there's a list of 15 things that they were, they thought they were not in control of. Someone was unfair to them. The card was were stacked against them. You say? Well, you can't worry about what you can't control. You have to deal with what you can control. Um, and then you have to focus on what you can control. So whatever those might have been on that list of what somebody can't control, uh, there has to be a way around that or to overcome that um, and put into a bucket of what could you control. Uh, maybe it was traffic, maybe you could have left earlier. Part of the extreme ownership is about developing solutions, not focusing on what the problem may be, mm. but focusing on what the solutions might be. Switch gears a little bit. We're talking to Greg Lalavi, who is uh, the business manager at the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825. They're a longtime friend of ours in the Lessons in Leadership family and also one of the big supporters of our work on public broadcasting. So, so I'm, I'm curious about this. How have you evolved as a public communicator slash leader? And then how has that translated to your folks? Well, for, for myself, I work at it constantly. If I have to do any kind of a big presentation, uh, I will go through it, 
multiple times. I'll rehearse it out loud. By the time I get up at the podium on Monday, I've gone through it so many times that probably the first third of it is darn near committed to memory. But I'm curious about this because I was actually saying to one of our clients yesterday, you actually have to own it going back to extreme ownerships. He said, what do you mean? I said, I know you know it. I know you've practiced it. But how do you own it? Well, you referenced before that I'm second generation operating engineer. My brothers are in this. Uh, so one of the things that you'll read in the book is one of the things that we need to do is believe in what you're talking about, believe in what you're doing. And I'll tell people all the time, when it comes to my life, uh, when it comes to something simple as my medical benefits have come for 54 years by way of operating engineers local 825. So I believe in the goodness of the organization. I believe in what it stands for. Uh, it drives the passion that I have for it and, and the passion behind my work. There's one more piece I want to run uh, past you. Mary and I, again, talk a lot about, um, <laughs> very often I run, I run late, even though everybody else is on time. And my excuse, which is not okay, is that, oh, I was just in the gym, as if anybody cares, right? But here's the point I'm making. In my mind, working out and trying to take care of myself uh, as best I can, is part of being a strong leader and effective in life and being the healthy, healthiest person in life. You have gone through a fascinating metamorphosis, if I can say that correctly, a transformation from when to when, because if you Google some of our <laughs> previous interviews with Greg, let's just say this on steveadobato.org, check them out. Um, you look a lot more fit today than you have in the past. Is that my imagination? Uh, no, from April 12th to today, I've lost 122 pounds. Um, and it has been a transformation. And one of those things uh, to talk about is actually a leadership lesson that I learned um, in a program that was authored by General George Casey, in which he talks about the anacronym of rest. And he says in, in a person's day, you have to find time to read, exercise, sleep, and think. R-E-S-T. Say it again. Read. Exercise, sleep, and think. What did that mean to you? Well, it meant that I had to take care of myself. To be an effective leader, um, that I had to take care of myself. I'm not a big gym rat. I'm not a, an exercise, um, you know, lover, if you will. But you I don't have, have to be. No, but you have to carve out 10 to 15 minutes to take that walk. Do or you take to do something now? positive. I, yeah. You build it in. Yes. You have to. You have to make the time. But you have to explain to folks how hard you've worked on the nutrition end. Because to me, that is a life and leadership lesson. Over time, this was happening. Because the other, list, the other leadership lesson that's striking me, if I'm wrong, tell me, is the level of discipline required. It's a lot of discipline. And, and uh, you know, as you probably know, psychologists will tell you, you've got to make it through three weeks to develop a habit. Uh, so you try to, you know, dig your way through those first few weeks. And I found it to be true. Once I got through um, the first couple of weeks, uh, my habits became just my habits. To what extent has it actually helped you as a leader? It's helped me tremendously. I, I feel as if I think more clearly. Um, I think I present better, uh, you know, outwardly. Um, so How about I confidence th level? Uh, tremendously. Um, really? Yeah, my, my, my wife actually hit me with that this morning. She, she feels as if my confidence level has uh, skyrocketed in the last couple of months. Greg, let me ask you this. Before I let you go, what would you say your greatest challenge is as a leader today? Uh, is trying to set my organization up for the future. Uh, so the future is going to look completely different. And I'll reference another book that I read this summer uh, called The Anticipatory Organization by Daniel Burris. And he talks about what he calls an exponential inflection point. And that is where forces combine that create exponential change and transformation. When you look at uh, computing speed, uh, when you look at bandwidth, when you look at digital storage, we only have to look at our cell phones to, to make this real. We went from analog signals to digital signals. We used to have a Palm Pilot that was separate from our phone. And as computing speed got better, as we went to digital uh, signals, as we got more storage on the machine or in the cloud, we watched the rise of the, the cell phone. And but what does this have to do with well, leadership? Well, you have to prepare your organization for the future. And in my organization, 
we're watching computers and artificial intelligence and GPS control come into the machinery. And with standing on the precipice of 5G being released broadly, this is going to change how fast signals can be done and how quickly you'll be able to displace people off of the machinery that we've been operating manually for 123 years. So devil's advocate, someone says, you know what? We're really losing jobs in this country because of automation, because of technology. What you are saying is maybe, maybe not. It's maybe not because you have to take every one of these things as an opportunity, not but a setback. it's a challenge. How's it's, it an opportunity? Well, it's a, it's a challenge, but the opportunity is there still be, is still going to be work to be done. Somebody's going to have to know how to set those computers up, how to interface with the robotics, how to deal with the mechanization. So there will be jobs there. The jobs will just be different than the ones as we know them today. How are you preparing folks for that? And let folks talk about innovation. Uh, Brian and his team at East May Media built this studio in a short period of time. Mm -hmm. You folks have built a training facility, set it up for folks. We have, uh, we're an accredited institute of higher learning now and which is the first step in our uh, ambition to become a two year uh, technical college standalone on our own, which wow. we think will be done by the end of this year. Innovation is not an option, right? No, it's, it's not an option at all, at, at all, because the w change is the one constant in the world. So when Burris talks about his exponential inflection point for those who study language, those are some really powerful words. <sighs> Um, and when you talk about the speed at which the world is going to change now that the platforms are all digital. That's right. The world's always changed. But now that we're in a digital world where things are done 24 hours a day as the world spins, as we go to bed tonight, it's nine o'clock somewhere else on a digital platform. The world never sleeps. You know, we've said this many times and, and I'll repeat it for our folks uh, watching and listening on Lessons. In leadership, by the way, you've been listening to Gray Lalavi from uh, Local 825, the Inter International Union of Operating Engineers. You know, this whole thing, and we'll go to a break in just a second, this whole thing about innovate or die, you could be like, oh, Steve has another slogan. Not really, because I've said this before. There are some organizations who are doing really well, who are making a lot of money, you know? Folks on Wall Street making money off them, the shareholders making money, the employees doing well, but they didn't innovate. They didn't make the changes. They were too comfortable with the status quo. Dare I use some names? Kodak, Blockbuster, Research in Motion, and you say, who are they? The parent company of BlackBerry. The list goes on of organizations, corporations doing well saying, we're good, we're standing pat, status quo is fine. What's this whole thing about it? People are gonna what, wanna watch movies in their home off of TV? People are gonna wanna take photos off their camera? That's ridiculous, we don't need to do that. Innovate or die, right? Well, the CEO of BlackBerry was infamous for saying nobody's ever going to want to watch videos on their phone. <laughs> <laughs> Just get on a bus or a subway that, that, one day and watch what well. everybody's doing. Could you yeah, imagine? Yeah, that worked well. So again, um, Mary, final words before we let Greg go, because I, I, watch, I watch Mary Gamba watching and listening to our fascinating guests on Lessons in Leadership, and I find that you are fascinated. I am. I absorb everything like a sponge, and I will use the example of if you're pointing and you have the three fingers coming your way. It's Thank a you. great, I know, it's a great example. <laughs> it's an absolute great example. But and I may be the first student in your college, too, because as I said, we, we had Greg on before uh, for our radio, just the radio show, right. and I am dying to use one of those big machines and go digging. You're so. welcome anytime. Yeah, you, you no, know, I'm so going to take you up on that. Yeah, Mary's gonna, yeah, just don't let her leave my organization. <laughs> we'll die. Innovator die? Without Mary Gamba, you die. Uh, but how about this one? It's so fascinating. As we let Greg go, Mary has worked with Greg for several years now. They've had countless conversations on the phone, email, text messages constantly. He walks in the studio here at East Main Media and she goes, it's so good to meet you for the first time. How crazy is that, that our interpersonal face-to-face -face is less but we interact with people all the time. Welcome to the digital divide. Exactly. This has been Greg Lalavie. I'm Steve Adubato. That's Mary Gamba. We are at East Main Media Studios. Lessons in Leadership. Come back right after this. This is Mary Gamba. If you want more leadership tips and tools, log on to stand-deliver.com. That's stand-deliver.com. Lessons in Leadership with me, Steve Adubato, and my colleague, Mary Gamba, is brought to you by Prager Metis, Gibbons PC, Valley, New Jersey Resources, and the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825. 
Welcome back to Lessons in Leadership. I'm Steve Adubato with my colleague, Mary Gamba. Mary, I know I, you thought I was going crazy when I was talking mm -hmm. about um, disruption because Greg Lalavi from Local 825 was talking about, he used the term, but I want to make it clear. Again, books are not props, they're real. A book by Terry Jones, a, a colleague and friend who I recently had a chance to interview on a conference down in Baltimore, his book is called Disruption, uh, the technological disruption coming for your company and what the heck you need to do about it. I added heck, that's not in there. Yeah, here's well, the that's thing. one I haven't read. You have to give us a little bit more information. I don't think well, that's here's what mainstream. It is. Right, right out of the box, right out of the box, we'll talk about disruption. Mm -hmm. But he says that disruption, you ready? This is from a quote that he uses from Mike Campbell in The, uh, the, sun, uh, the, in the sun Also Rises. You ready? Question. So how did you go bankrupt? Two ways, gradually and then suddenly. Wow, what does that that's mean to powerful. You? Yeah. Uh, what that means to me is that sometimes you may think that something is way down the line, that maybe whether it's a, a job or, I mean, this is obviously they're talking about something unfortunate, but it seems like you don't realize how close it is until it happens. And so Disruption. therefore, mm -hmm. the whole concept, I think people think we may be beating a dead horse, innovate or die. It's not just some slogan. The fact is, we talked about the companies before, and that's it. just Google this. Speaking about innovation, where was Google 20 years ago? Google organizations that died because they didn't innovate, whether it's BlackBerry, whether it's Blockbuster, whether it's Kodak, it's a long, long list. And the reality is, and again, the quote, I was watching a movie about Steve Jobs the mm -hmm. other day, uh, the, the movie that was out a few years ago. Fascinating. The quote from Steve Jobs, read it for mm -hmm. us. Absolutely. Innovation distinguishes between a leader and a follower. What does that mean to you? You need to, in order to innovate, you need somebody to lead that innovation. Innovation means change. And innovation is a new buzzword, and rightfully so, because especially with everything changing, we've got digital, we've got uh, TV, everything is right there computers, we've got our, our phones where you can log artificial on. Artificial intelligence. What about the seminar, excuse mm -hmm. me, the workshop? Forget about it. I'm thinking seminars and workshop. We did mm -hmm. a whole public broadcasting special on voice technology with our colleagues at the New at Jersey NJIT. Institute of Technology. Absolutely. On voice. Yeah, absolutely. Amazon Alexa. You could speak in your house. I'll walk in my house and I'll say, you know, Alexa, turn on my lights. Alexa, play country music. Alexa, do this, do that. And she just does it. You don't even have to think. You don't have to lift a finger. And it's fascinating. It's scary because you always wonder who's listening to you when. Uh, but once you get past that, it's a matter of just knowing that these are the times are changing. But, but think about this. It's not just that the times are changing. Mm -hmm. Is that the, the connection to you may ask, what's the connection in leadership? Mm -hmm. It's that Steve Jobs, even though he had a terrible personality and was awfully mean to people and would embarrass them in public, watch the movie, you'll see what I mean. And again, um, you read about him. It's not, um, people don't disagree with that analysis. But the other side of him was he saw things that others couldn't even imagine. And his biggest challenge, as I had thought about it, was he was trying to explain what he saw. And they didn't see what he saw and were turned off and afraid. And he's like, no, we have to move forward. And it didn't. And by the way, he often failed. Right. So talk about the idea of failure. Mm -hmm. Right. And innovation. Yeah. Well, uh, before we get to failure, just when you were talking about uh, one of the keys to leadership is being persuasive, being able to persuade others when they didn't even see that it was possible. So, Or they know, don't think it is. Or they don't think it is. They didn't see it that way. Or worse, they may think something totally different. And then you may have to really switch and negotiate and go back and forth and change their mind. But with failure, one of the reasons innovation will stall or just not happen at all is because people are fearful of failing. And that's just unfortunate because if you, if he was afraid to say, wow, let us, you know, take the iPhone, it was great. I mean, the original iPhone and now we're, we're up to like the 10, 11, I don't yep, even yep. know. And every time it's like, oh, wait, we're not going to have one camera on this iPhone. We're going to put three cameras. But Why? Like, excuse me. That doesn't mean we think that every innovation as mm -hmm. a leader like it's a great innovation. Right. Sometimes you ask why they even do exactly. this. It doesn't sometimes, make sense, but go ahead. I think sometimes it's Don't unnecessary. Don't innovate just to, for the point of innovation. And sometimes, and, and again, I mean, I love my iPhone. I love Apple products. And sometimes I think, wow, they just changed the phone. So this way more people go out and buy it, right? Um, and the same with anything, whether you're talking about electric cars. Innovation is really finding a new way to do things that hopefully do things that will hopefully leave the world a better place. And that's what I feel innovation is all about. Quick, quick follow up on this. And again, our good friend Kevin Cummings from Investors is in the house. He's sitting there watching us right there and um, talk about innovation. He's been innovating for a long time and he's going to be talking about some of the innovation that he's been involved in with, his, with the folks at Investors. But I'm curious about this. 
What about the fact, and we have talked about this countless times, first time on video, it is very difficult to communicate to people around you that innovation is necessary, A, and B, that they need to be a part of it. Like this, this innovation, I know we keep talking about this, the innovation of doing this, changing from what we're doing every day. You hire a producer who comes in, he or she comes in, they're going to produce a show, Steve's going to host the show, and we're going to put it on PBS and other outlets, and that's what we do. But we're going to create this podcast, we're going to create this radio show, we're going to put it on video, and Mary, I'd like you to be the co-host because you and I talk leadership all the time. Your first instinct wasn't, oh, great, I'm all in, was it? No, no. I, I mean, my first reaction was, number one, I'm not a host. Number two, I'm not a producer. I know what I know, and this was something that was on familiar territory. But being an I'm innovator— sorry. What, what, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Life got- begins, all right, so for those listening on the radio, Steve is holding up one of his props, and it says, life begins at the end of your comfort zone. And, but that's you not- unco- You weren't comfortable doing this out of the box. No, no, not at all. A year later, how are you feeling? I'm very comfortable. So what's the point yeah. here? No, it, it, well, the point is what we've been, you know, nailing in this entire time, which is that you can get out of your comfort zone, and it will be okay. Fear is natural, but it's what you do with that fear and how you channel it, which is really going to make the difference between true leaders and those who are super successful- and those that kind of just toe the line and they're just going to plateau. And that's and, okay. And to that point, there are some folks that we know on our team, and I have no problem saying this, that I've said I'd like you to come on and I'd like you to be have a conversation with us. And I know what they're really thinking is, you didn't hire me to do that. I got hired to do this because they look at the job description. And my response will be, but we're evolving. We're changing. I need you to do this. And I see something in you that allows me to say that you'd be a great addition. No, nope, it's not what I do. I'm uncomfortable doing it. The question for a leader is, and I've said, asked you this countless times, how hard do you push? In certain cases, and you and I have agreed to disagree, in certain cases when using this as an example, using this story, I think there are certain people who are- It's not just are, about us. For everybody no, 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 listening, but I'm saying, watching if someone right is, now. If someone really puts their foot down and says, listen, that's really not for me, but then what you would like to hear is, however, let me just give you another uh, place where I feel like I can be helpful. That would be a that's good way. That's the leader's job? Uh, no, no, no. I'm thinking that would be, if that were me, if you said to me, Mary, I want you to help me with this or I, or this radio show. Again, it right. wasn't something Which that is I now came on to video. you. Yeah, exactly. It wasn't, I, I didn't have a lifelong dream of doing this or I never saw myself in this capacity. But if you get yourself out of that comfort zone and you try it, it was never in my job description. And, and again, right now, uh, we are just in the process of hiring a new team member. And the one thing that I said to every single person that we interviewed for this position was, We need you to not be wet to this job description. Sure, here it is. Here's a piece of paper. Here are the types of responsibilities we anticipate you doing. A year from now, if you're still doing this, we have a problem and you need to be adaptable. And then I ask them to share an example where they're flexible and they're willing to try different things. Because if not, it's just not going to be a good fit for ours or any organization. So interesting because Mary and I do disagree about this because I'm a big believer in pushing people harder than I think Mary sometimes thinks I should. I know we have to, Brian, I see that sign. Again, every time I'm getting that sign, it says wrap it up, but I'll just leave it at this. To me, one of the signs of a really good leader, and trust me, I'm not saying I'm a great leader. I'm saying I'm a leader who learns every day, hopefully, that sometimes really good leaders, leaders who are learning, see things in people that they don't see in themselves, even if that other person's saying that's not me. Easier said than done, I know. But that is one of the great things about lessons in leadership, that we challenge ourselves. By the way, as we let people go, Mary, let's thank East Made Media Studio for making this possible. Everyone listening on AM 970, on our podcast, and on the video side as well. Folks can find us where? Absolutely. They can find us on our website, stand-deliver.com. And also, they can uh, follow you on Facebook and on Twitter, Steve Adubato, PhD. And that's spelled A-D-U-B-A-T-O. How great is our uh, website at stand-deliver.com? What can people get? There? A lot of free stuff. We've got articles on every topic involving Did you say leadership. Free stuff. Free stuff. And we also have links for your five books. Lessons in Leadership is your most recent. We are working on a new one, uh, soon to be titled. Just to clarify, the books aren't free. No, okay, the books are not Steve free. Adubato, Mary Gamber, this has been Lessons in Leadership. You see the logo there. We'll check you next time. This is Mary Gamba. If you want more leadership tips and tools, log on to stand-deliver.com. That's stand-deliver.com. Lessons in Leadership with me, Steve Adubato, and my colleague, Mary Gamba, is brought to you by Prager Metis, Gibbons PC, Valley, New Jersey Resources, and the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825.
Think Tank, the podcast with me, Steve Adubato, is brought to you by these public-spirited organizations. The law firm of Gibbons PC, RWJ Barnabas Health, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825, PSENG, committed to providing safe, reliable energy now and in the future. And by Keystone Mountain Lakes Regional Council of Carpenters. Your future is in our building. Promotional support provided by Insider NJ and by NJ Advance Media. I'm Steve Arvado. Welcome to Think Tank, the podcast. We're at the East Main Media Studio in beautiful I'll call it, Brian, Northern New Jersey. Does that work? Yeah, fair enough. What town are we in? Little Falls, New Jersey. All right. Big things going on in Little Falls. How corny was that? Uh, This is Think Tank, the podcast. And I'm here actually in the studio with the senior producer of Think Tank, the actual show on PBS. Nicole, how are you doing? Nicole Swinerton. I'm doing pretty well. How about you? Good. I just actually asked uh, Nicole to jump in that seat just in case anything happens and she needs to fix anything. That is what we do here. We deal with difficult issues. And that's what exactly what I talked about to uh, with Senate President Steve Sweeney in the state of New Jersey, who is considered by many to be the second most powerful person in the state. Some may debate that and say he's closer than being the second most powerful person in the state. He, uh, in this interview, we talk about a whole range of issues, the issues of taxes, the millionaire's tax, legalization of marijuana, the tax incentive strategy in New Jersey, what makes sense and what doesn't. And to break things down before we listen to the Senate president. We're joined by our good friend, Dr. Ben Dworkin, who's the director of the Rowan Institute for Public Policy and Citizenship. How you doing, Ben? I'm doing fine, Steve. Thanks for having me on. Great. How are things down at uh, Rowan University? Always busy, finishing up the semester, looking forward to the rest of the year. Let's do this, Ben. You and I talk politics all the time, but we're also way more interested in public policy than inside the Beltway or the State House, if you will, politics. What is your sense of of what the challenge is or the issue is between the Senate President Steve Sweeney, who we're about to listen to in this really important conversation we had with him in studio, and the governor, Governor Murphy, what is going on? There's a huge amount of tension in Trenton over everything that happens because of the uh, difficulties that both the governor and the Senate president have with each other. And there are three real causes for this tension. First is ambition, because fundamentally one is governor and one wants to be governor. And secondly, it's personality. These are both strong-willed and powerful men, but they have very different personalities. They have different backgrounds. They have different leadership styles. And third is history. In 2017, the New Jersey Education Association, what we typically refer to as the teachers union, went after Steve Sweeney in his reelection campaign. They spent millions of dollars, the most expensive legislative campaign in history. And what was so frustrating for Sweeney and his supporters was that the governor, who had a close relationship with the New Jersey Education Association, didn't call them off, didn't tell them to back off. So you went into Trenton when they both got elected with a residual sort of bad blood of of history. So ambition, personality, and history are really the fundamental reasons why there's so much tension between these two people. You wonder why we have Think Tank, the podcast. It's to have people like Dr. Ben Dworkin break it down for us. And by the way, uh, you mentioned the New Jersey Education Association. I want to acknowledge that they, in fact, are one of our overall underwriters. But this particular Think Tank, the podcast, is being made possible. And, and Ben, if you don't mind, I'm going to thank our friends who uh, are funding this program, the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825, Horizon, as well as Gibbons. You know, I'm curious about this. Nationalize this for us, uh, Dr. Dworkin. How much of this is ideological in terms of Governor Murphy clearly being in the progressive, liberal, if you will, wing of the party, more aligned with those who are looking to raise taxes on wealthier Americans, more specifically in New Jersey, Governor Murphy advocates uh, increasing taxes on millionaires. Senate President Sweeney has resisted that. And a whole range of other issues. He's more progressive. He's more to the left. The Senate President is a, if you will, a Joe Biden Democrat, much more of a centrist, much more in the Nancy Pelosi camp. So while they're both Democrats, are they really both Democrats? 
Yes, they're both Democrats, and they are both Democrats, to answer that last question. <laughs> but in different, um, can, different look, wings of the party, fair to say? Somewhat. I would characterize it differently. I, th- I think a context is important here. First of all, Sweeney and Murphy have worked a lot together. We focus on the bad blood, but in terms of getting things done, there is a huge amount of progressive legislation that New Jersey has passed that could not have happened had it not been for the support of the governor and the Senate president, and we should add the Speaker of the General Assembly, Craig Coughlin, from Middlesex County. So we're talking about a lot of paid family leave, equal pay legislation, funding of Planned Parenthood, uh, a half dozen gun control laws, higher minimum wage, funding for preschool education, funding for free community college tuition. This was all done by these two people working together. So we are far from, in New Jersey, we are far from being dysfunctional. Don't confuse us with uh, Washington, Ben. Exactly. (laughs) Don't confuse us with Washington. No, it's it's important because sometimes we focus on what isn't working uh, so much that we sort of forget. Look at all the things that have been done when the Democrats took full control of the legislature. Now, people obviously can disagree with that agenda, but it's not like these two people didn't find ways and continue to find ways to work together. Mm. Uh, Nationally, because you asked about how much is this sort of an ideological split, I think it is a a little bit, but it's it's a much bigger fight than Sweeney and uh, Murphy. Nationally, what we're seeing is a fight between those who want change and want it to come by working through the system and those in the Democratic Party who believe the system itself is corrupt and inherently biased and therefore needs to be upended. What you have here in New Jersey, uh, that fight has certainly come down here, but the fight between Sweeney and Murphy is not really easily put into those uh, categories. These guys have endorsed a progressive agenda uh, because it's what the people want. They want pre-K. They want free college uh, tuition. Do they want legalized marijuana? I'm sorry, Ben Dwork. By the way, Ben Dworkin, director of the Rowan Institute for Public Policy and Citizenship. Before I let you go real quick, do they want legalized sure. marijuana? Do both? In fact, if the governor, Governor Murphy, and the Senate president really want to legalize marijuana and the Assembly Speaker Craig Coffin, if they really wanted to legalize marijuana, wouldn't that be done? It's a much tougher issue because a lot of people who uh, they can usually count on their support among the membership, that is Senate members and Assembly members, you've got to get the majorities in both of those uh, houses. A lot of those folks are not convinced. Got it. They're the ones who are, who are holding off, and they consider it a moral issue, which is why the legislature is punting and the plan is to put it on the ballot, let the 70 percent of, of New Jerseyans who claim in public opinion polls that they do support marijuana legalization, support it as a constitutional amendment in November 2020, and then it will happen. Got it. By the way, before we let Ben go, ben go I want to thank our funders again at the um, International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825, Horizon and Gibbons. By the way, Nicole Swinerton, the senior producer of Think Tank, before we let Dr. Dworkin go, let folks know again where they can find Think Tank, the podcast, which is produced so excellently by Lauren Gary, our senior producer, hanging in the background, making sure things happen. Uh, Where can folks find us? Sure. So to hear more Think Tank podcasts, you can subscribe on Apple Podcasts or Google Play, or you can visit our website at steveadubato.org. That's A-D-U-B-A-T-O. And you can follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato and on Facebook at Steve Adubato PhD to see all our great content. And also, on the other end, you can find Think Tank, the show, on WNET, NJTV, WHYY, and a range of other places as well. Ben, before I let you go, real quick, and we listen to Senate President Steve Sweeney coming up in just a moment after a quick public service announcement. 2020 in New Jersey, the State House, the level of cooperation between the Senate President, Steve Sweeney, who you'll listen to in a moment, the Governor, Governor Murphy, who will be interviewing at Drumthwacket, the official governor's mansion, if you will, in just a couple of months, and the Speaker of the House, Craig Coughlin. All Democrats, what degree of cooperation do you expect, Dr. Dworkin? I expect that it'll be actually pretty high, uh, probably a little bit better than what we've seen uh, in the past two years, when in fact, 
We didn't get the budget done on time, but it took an extra week, but then they got the budget done. So again, far from dysfunction. That We should remember that the governor is up for re-election in 2021, and I think he wants to head into these last two years trying to find ways to get some things done. So long as we don't hit a recession, uh, that is, so long as the economy Ouch. doesn't tank. Nicole that, just made that, a face. Then all bets are off. <laughs> but if that, if that doesn't happen, then everybody's going to be uh, trying to move forward. There will be the residual tensions and the sniping back and forth, but things will get done. 2021, Demo- uh, excuse me, Democratic nomination for governor. Is the governor, Governor Murphy, running pretty much unopposed? Or if you're a betting person, does the Senate president challenge him in a Democratic primary? I would not bet on the Senate president uh, challenge him or any serious candidate challenging uh, the governor at, at all. He's got more money. He's still popular uh, as politicians go. And his message is one that a lot of people, certainly in a, those who vote in a Democratic primary, agree with. And when you've got those three things, it's really hard to topple. This has been Dr. Ben Dworkin, the director of the Rowan Institute for Public Policy and Citizenship, our good friends and partners down at Rowan. Um, I want to thank you, Ben. I'm looking forward to having you in the studio talking a whole range of public policy issues about citizenship, about why these things matter. This has been Think Tank, the podcast. I want to thank you for joining us. Thank you, Ben. All the best, my friend. Thank you, Steve. I appreciate the opportunity. You got it. In just a moment, you're going to be listening to, watching, if you will, the Senate President Steve Sweeney talking about his view of the world as the Senate president. Important stuff. Check it out. Construction companies work at the heart of our communities. So do the operating engineers of Local 825, who build our roads and bridges and ensure the safe transmission of energy that keeps us on the move. Local 825 works with contractors as partners in quality, safety, and training. Our achievements stand as monuments to collaboration that will last for generations. This message has been brought to you by the members of Operating Engineers Local 825. Better building begins here. I'm Steve Adubato. We're coming to you from the Agnes Varis NJTV studio in Newark. We're pleased to once again welcome the Senate president in the great state of New Jersey, Senator Steve Sweeney. Good to see you, Senator. It's good to see you, Steve. Um, Let's jump right into this. Path to Progress is a report that has been researched, submitted, and now says, what are the keys to fiscal health in New Jersey? Well, look, there's several. But you started this whole thing. Well, yeah, I just asked a bunch of experts. Basically, the the best New Jersey has. Not partisan in any way at all, just experts. How do we fix what's wrong? And they came up with, you know, 200 recommendations. We whittled it down to, I I think it's 36 or 27. I, I forget the number now. It's been a little while. But it's, it's hitting at the things that we all know need to be done, but they're the hard things. Top of the list. Pension reform, health care reform, school consolidation, things that we've talked about for years that is now to a point, these are the big things that have to get done in order to save billions of dollars for taxpayers. Because New Jersey's biggest problem is cost. And without addressing the problems, we're never going to we're just going to just keep pouring money in it and looking for new taxes to raise without fixing the structural problems doesn't work. By the way, uh, by the way, if you listen to us on the audio side, Senator Steve Sweeney, Senate President Steve Sweeney is with us on State of Affairs. I'm Steve Adubato. Question is this. New Jersey's fiscal health. One of the issues that you and the governor disagree on is that he believes strongly that in order to strengthen the fiscal health of the state, we need to, in fact, increase taxes on those who earn the most money. After a million dollars, every dollar is taxed more. He says, if we don't do that, we're not gonna have money for a lot of the programs that people want. He's wrong because those are the people that can leave and after the federal salt, you know, the State and local tax deduction with President Trump, the federal law? Yes. Cap at 10 grand, that's it? Yeah. State income tax, property taxes, more than that, you're on your own. Exactly. Can't write it off, go ahead. So now you have a population that's just got hit with another tax because people didn't mind paying them as much because they wrote them off. Now they can't. And my point is, if you want to talk about revenue raisers, fix the structural problems first, then you'll know what you need, and then if you have to talk about taxes, then talk about them. But without fixing what's wrong in New Jersey, and this is where I am really frustrated with a governor that wrote a report when Dick Cody was the governor. Let's make it clear, uh, Senator Dick Cody, then acting governor, 
Had Ex- Cody, he had a commission that looked at the pension situation. And Murph, Governor Murphy at the time, private citizen, did what? He chaired it and wrote the report that said we need a dramatic change, that this wasn't sustainable. That was back in over. You're talking about the pension and health care yeah. situation with Steve, public employees. Steve, back then, the deficit was $11 billion. Today, the pension deficit's over $100 billion, about $150, and $115. And our health care, retiree health care deficit, is over, over $100 billion. So now we're about $220 billion, billion, not million, in the hole. So you can't raise taxes enough to fill that hole. When does the bill come due? The bill's coming due now. And if we don't fix the pension soon, if we don't fix the pension soon, by 2023, you're going to have a $4 billion deficit in New Jersey. In the that, budget? Yeah, without a reset, without a recession. So if I give you the millionaire's tax... Right. If I give you the million, what does tax, it bring in? It's inflated the number they use, but I'll give it to them: five hundred and thirty-six million. An increased revenue to the state. Go ahead. If no one leaves, so okay, I'll give it to them: five thirty-six. What about the other? What about the the other two and a half billion? Steve, we can't raise taxes to get us out of this. We need to make structural reforms. Listen, I want to make sure teachers have good pensions. Same with all public employees. But other states, 12 other states in this country, have changed their pension structure. But we have to, but respectfully, Senate President Steve Sweeney with us on State of Affairs. I'm Steve Adubato. A few years ago, didn't you, together with Republican Governor Chris Christie, work on this, and there was pension reform? It wasn't enough, though, Steve. That's the problem. We did what we could get done. Because these are big things, like I said, these are things you talk about forever, and it's very rare you do. If we don't do this, Oregon just did it. Portland, uh, Portland, Oregon, just, I mean the state of Oregon, just changed their pension system. Democrat governor, Democrat uh, legislature, both houses. What do you mean change? Be specific. Well, like what? Be they, specific as to two, what needs to be done. In 2003, they went to a hybrid system, which was so much, like the first 40,000, this is what we're proposing, is a pension. Anything above that is basically annuity. Like, you know, we're going to take a percentage of your income, put it in annuity, invest it. That's what Oregon has. Isn't that risky with the stock market being no, so volatile? No, because when you do, listen, when you're doing, if, if it's, I won't call it a 401k. I'm calling it an annuity. Some do, but go ahead. But I won't for one reason, because there's no match. So if you're doing it, that's what the other states do. But you don't put it in high risk. You know, I deal with annuities all the time. In your work? In, As an iron worker. Yes. And who represents, who deals with the union very directly. And I, we all have annuities to supplement the pensions. But this way, you start to change, Steve. You start to move the, the process. If we do it today, 30 years from now, it'll be fixed. But if we don't do it, in Oregon, when they did it, mm. their pension funding dropped from 90% to 80%. And the, and, the, and the governor and the legislature made changes to it again, legislatively. We're in like the high 30s. We're almost bankrupt and people don't realize you it. You use that word sometimes. and I, 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 Is that the right word or yes. is that hyperbole an no. exaggeration? It's not an exaggeration. If we continue the course we're going, we're going to be bankrupt. And here's the bigger problem. We can't fund anything, Steve. Everything has to go to pension and health care now. Everything. You know, when you look at this budget, you know, we're squeezing pennies here and there to do additional things. If the pension system had not been played with, starting with the Whitman administration, the pension payment would have been $800 million. When you say played with, either not, not put money into it or taking money out, go ahead. Bonding, and then government's not funding. Right. And, but, but look, there was a little secret to that one. I shouldn't say taking money out. It wasn't taken out. But it was bonded. They, they bonded, bonded the pension. But what else they did, Steve, what else they did was there was a wink and a nod when the pension payments weren't being made. I was there. I watched it. And I was like, what are you guys going to do with your pension? What did they think was going to happen when the bill came due? Well, the problem is they weren't going to be there. The people that made these decisions, the the people (sighs) that are here today are not the ones that made the decisions. So I don't blame them. But you and the the governor and the other legislators down, other state leaders, it's your job to, quote, deal with it. That's where we are. So let me ask you, say it doesn't happen. What does it mean for the average citizen of New Jersey, not a policymaker, not an insider, not somebody who follows what's going on, in the state capitol every day, what would it mean to their lives? They're going to have to find ways to raise taxes, whether it's increased sales taxes. Look, if the pension system goes broke and we have to start paying out $6 billion a year, a year, and we're not far from that, you know, uh, there's there's zones like a green, yellow, and red 
when you're in trouble with pensions, we're in the 30s, high 30s, and it keeps dropping as we keep putting more money into it. Mm. So Steve, it's one of these things that it's not working, no matter how much money we, we will continue to fund our full obligation. Knowing a recession's coming. What, say a recession's coming, could it mean, Senator President Sweeney, that fewer dollars, state dollars to public schools in your community, could it mean that? Absolutely. Could it mean fewer dollars for women's health care services? All across the board. Fewer dollars for infrastructure projects. Well, now we dedicate you got the transportation the trust fund. Yeah, but, with but transportation how about higher trust education, fund? where we have the second most expensive it's higher education system? There. Oh yeah, everyone's going to have to take a cut because there's no funding for anything. By the way, real quick, switch gears on this. It's a fiscal issue as well. You and the governor appear to be at loggerheads on this. There are several institutions of higher learning, some of whom we collaborate with, and other entities. Cancer funding in one of the um, initiatives. Where, where is that? I think it's $10 million. That they froze in Camden. Okay, make 100%. that clear. Okay, so there, there's 230 some odd million dollars yeah. frozen from what the legislature wanted to pass in the budget, and the governor said, no, we're not doing that. And how much is that? It's policy driven. There's a question here, trust me. How much of it is policy driven and just the fact that the two of you often don't get along? It was politics. Steve, you know why you know it was politics? Because 80% of what he froze is what he put in the budget. When he attacked the legislature saying we filled the budget with pork, right? And he said, I'm pork repeating. Pork meaning projects that are just for your district? Go ahead. And he said it. Well, then freeze those projects. If, if you're feeling they're not worthy, freeze them. But you froze 80% of the projects that were meant to help people. Why okay. is all the cancer funding frozen, all of it, in southern New Jersey, but they you think it was Northern. targeted to Southern New Jersey? Well, Partly listen, because you're not, there? No, no, no. There, there's th things in Essex County yeah, that there were are. targeted. There's a zoo I know of, there, a there turtle was, zoo. There's things in Essex, there's things in Central, but they were targeted for anybody that resisted and disagreed. And, and unfortunately, Steve, look, okay. this gets personal for me. I lost my mother and my, my brother to cancer. Why would you deny people in Southern New Jersey dollars to deal with cancer treatment? It's offensive. And it's unfair. You know, I went after Chris Christie when he cut a budget one time and called him a whole bunch of bad names. I don't know what to say when Phil Murphy says, why well, support these things? Well, then fund them. Because, by the way, they can't answer one question. Not one question. How they came up with a list. And what they tell of you. Of what they weren't going to fund. Yeah. And what they say. The executive order speaks for itself. I said, no. Well, tell me who was in a room and who made the decisions, and why this was funded and this wasn't funded, and why would you freeze 80% of your own funding? Stay on that, Senator. I want to make something clear. Senator President Steve Sweeney with us here, Steve Adubato here on the studios of NJTV for State of Affairs. You may be asking yourself, what does the governor have to say about this? I want to be really clear about this. We have and will continue to work with the governor's office to try to get him in this studio for a State of Affairs State of Affairs interview, so that he can offer his perspective on this. I want to make it clear, we've tried. It's been a scheduling issue to date. We will get that done. That being said. I, I would love to see him. Okay, can we do this? Sure. Quick. You called for a ban on vaping. Yes. 30 seconds. Why? Because it's an epidemic right now, and, and you know, these vaping stores are actually using products that are illegal products out of, you know, they talk about the corner, Steve. They're getting them out of China. They're getting into the, in the stream, and people are getting sick. It's, it's not like, it's, not, it's, it's, it's worse than cigarettes, because cigarettes is a, is a chronic effect. It takes a long time. This is an acute effect where you vape one night, and the next day you're in the hospital. You believe that this ban is possible? Yes. There's support for it? Yes. Governor Murphy communicated that he would be supportive? He didn't communicate he wouldn't, and he called for everyone to stop banning immediately. You saw not to stop banning, to ban immediately? To, to stop vaping immediately. Okay. And, you know, Governor Cuomo just came out yes. with an announcement. And President and, Trump has said some things on this. God, it scares me. But, but, but he said but, something but similar. he's right. He's right on this. I can't believe I'm agreeing with him, but he's on right this. on this. Yes. Do this one. Marijuana. Yeah. How far away are we from the legalization of cannabis slash marijuana in the state of New Jersey? The governor uh, wants it. I want it. So does the speaker. Speaker uh, Craig Coughlin wants it. So what stands in the way? Uh, some of my members. And we are going to push in lame duck to get it done. 
If not, we'll put Lame it in. Lame duck, meaning after the November election, after the up November until election. January, the new legislature takes January, over. January, whatever, mid-January. And if, and if not, we'll prepare a ballot initiative that we know will be successful. Okay, real quick, uh, I've talked about this before. We have an initiative called Right From The Start NJ, focusing on child care for infants and toddlers, improving that situation. Just been $54 million of state money going to that. What more do we need to do? Well, you know, Steve, we need to fund more, to be perfectly honest with you. And like Tressa Ruiz, Senator Ruiz and myself, yes. she, she's a champion for pre-K, you know, right? She sure has. She has a small we, child as well. I'm very focused we on this. Need, we need to get to birth. We need to get children at birth. My daughter was a, was a preemie. She has Down syndrome. She was in early intervention. The earlier you get someone, the more they learn. Your brain, 85% of your brain develops from birth to five years old. So we should be looking at putting as much money in as we can early because it's, it's that old Fram commercial, pay me now, pay me later. Got to pay either way. You, you make that investment up front. Thank you, Senator. Thanks, sir. So that was New Jersey Senate President Steve Sweeney. We had an in-depth interview. That was a couple months ago. Let me update you on a couple of things. First of all, this vaping thing. We have two teenage boys, and whether you have boys, girls, or anyone who is of age to potentially be vaping, that's some serious stuff. Since we did that interview with uh, Senator Sweeney, Governor Murphy, this is one of the few things they've worked together on. Governor Murphy has actually signed a law, the first in the nation, that bans flavored vaping products that takes effect uh, April 2020. Let's make sure that we understand how serious the situation is with, when it comes to vaping. So when people say things like, oh, we don't really know how bad it is, that's it right there. But that's what they said about cigarettes for a period of time until we knew then it was too late for many. That being said, I also want to do this. I want to thank our funders who have made, who continue to make Think Tank the podcast possible. That is, in fact, uh, the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825, Horizon and Gibbons. I want to thank those folks for helping us bring this program, not only on the audio side, but on the video side to uh, the folks at News 12 Plus. That's every Sunday, by the way, at 1030. A couple things before we... Uh, close out this podcast. You know, it's interesting. People say there's a partisan divide. There's polarization in the nation. Democrats, Republicans, conservative, liberals. They don't talk. They don't get along. They don't get things done. Think about this. In New Jersey, it's so-called blue state. Most elected officials are Democrats. Phil Murphy's a Democrat. Senate President Steve Sweeney, a Democrat. Where are they on the millionaire's tax, trying to increase taxes on millionaires? A stalemate. Where are they when it comes to the energy master plan? We don't know, but it looks like they're not talking very much about that. Where are we when it comes to the legalization of marijuana? They're not talking anymore. Here's my point. When it comes to Phil Murphy, the governor, and the Senate president, Steve Sweeney, both Democrats, their first job is not to be the most powerful person in New Jersey, but to get things done on behalf of the people. Look at New Jersey Transit, countless tens, hundreds of thousands of people every day waiting to find out when that train's coming, if that train's coming, if it's going to be delayed. Why am I raising all these issues? Because Phil Murphy, the governor, and the Senate President Steve Sweeney have one job, and that's to get things done on behalf of the people of New Jersey. Stop acting like immature fourth graders who can't play in the sandbox nice, even if you disagree, even if you don't like each other. And we'll be sitting down with Governor Murphy at Drum Thwacket, and I'll be asking him these same questions. Not whether he likes Sweeney or not, but why can't they figure out how to get things done on behalf of the people in New Jersey? Because last time they checked, that's why they get paid. I'm Steve Adubato. This has been Think Tank, the podcast every Sunday, right here on News 12 Plus at till 1030, right? 1030 every Sunday on, on News 12 Plus. When I look around, that means other people know more than I do. I'm Steve Adubato. This has been Think Tank, the podcast. Make sure that you check us out. But most importantly, think for yourself. I work for Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield, and I'm a catastrophic case manager. I'm a nurse. I feel a sense of responsibility to each and every member that I speak with on the phone. I know where they live. I know their towns. I know the hospitals they go to. A lot of times I know their physicians, and um, I love helping people at very difficult times of their lives. The job I have now is the perfect job for me. I think I was born a nurse. 
podcast with me, Steve Arbato, is brought to you by these public spirited organizations. The law firm of Gibbons PC, RWJ Barnabas Health, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825, PSENG, Keystone Mountain Lakes Regional Council of Carpenters, promotional support provided by Insider NJ, and by NJ Advance Media.